a leather bag filled with food, and a flask of hot tea. A pair of fur-lined gloves that Sinna left behind. Three twigs, broken from the naked leaves, lying in the snow, pointing in the direction I will travel. This is what I leave for Gale at our usual meeting place on the first Sunday after the Harvest Festival. I have continued on through the cold, misty woods, breaking a path that will be unfamiliar to Gale, but is simple for my feet to find. It leads to the lake. I no longer trust that our regular rendezvous spot offers privacy, and I'll need that and more to spill my guts to Gale today. But will he even come? If he doesn't, I'll have no choice but to risk going to his house in the dead of night. There are things he has to know, things I need him to help me figure out. Once the implications of what I was seeing on Mayor Undersea's television hit me, I made for the door and started down the hill. Hall. Just in time, too, because the mayor came up the steps moments later. I gave him a wave. Looking for Madge? He said in a friendly tone. Yes, I want to show her my dress, I said. Well, you know where to find her. Just then, another round of beeping came from his study. His face turned grave. Excuse me, he said. He went into his study and closed the door tightly. I waited in the hall until I had composed myself, reminded myself I must act naturally. Then I found Madge in her room, sitting at her dressing table, brushing out her wavy blonde hair before a mirror. She was in the same pretty white dress she'd worn on reaping day. She saw my reflection behind her and smiled. Look at you, like you came right off the streets of the Capitol. I stepped in closer. My fingers touched the Mockingjay. Even my pin now. Mockingjays are all the rage in the Capitol, thanks to you. Are you sure you don't want it back? I asked. Don't be silly. It was a gift, said Madge. She tied back her hair in a festive gold ribbon. Where'd you get it anyway? I asked. It was my aunt's, she said, but I think it's been in the family a long time. It's a funny choice, a mocking jay, I said. I mean, because of what happened in the rebellion with the jabber jays backfiring on the Capitol and all. The jabber, day, jabber jays were mutations, genetically enhanced male birds created by the Capitol as weapons to spy on rebels in the districts. They could remember and repeat long passages of human speech, so they were sent into rebel areas to capture our words and return them to the capital. The rebels caught on and turned them against the capital by sending them home loaded with lies. When this was discovered, the jabber jays were left to die. In a few years, they became extinct in the wild, but not before they had mated with female mockingbirds, creating an entirely new species. But mocking jays were never a weapon, said Madge. They're just songbirds, right? Yeah, I guess so, I said, but it's not true. A mocking bird is just a songbird. A mocking jay is a creature that the capital never intended to exist. They hadn't counted on the highly controlled jabber jay having the brains to adapt to the wild, to pass on its genetic code, to thrive in a new form. They hadn't anticipated its will to live. Now, as I trudge through the snow, I see the mocking jays hopping about on the branches as they pick up on other birds' melodies, replicate them, and then transform them into something new. As always, they remind me of Rue. I think of the dream that I had last night on the train, the last night on the train, where they followed her in a mocking jay form. I wish I could have stayed asleep just a bit longer and found out where she was trying to take me. It's a hike to the lake, no question. If he decides to follow me at all, Gail's going to be put out by his excessive use of energy that he could be better spent in hunting. He was conspicuously absent from the dinner at the mayor's house, although the rest of his family came. Hazel said he was homesick, which was an obvious lie. I couldn't find him at the harvest festival either. Vic told me he was out hunting. That was probably true. After a couple of hours, I reach an old house near the edge of the lake. Maybe house is too big a word for it. It's only one room, about 12 feet square. My father thought that a long time ago, there were a lot of buildings, and you can still see some of the foundations 
and people came to them to play and fish in the lake. This house outlasted the others because it's made of concrete, floor, roof, ceiling. Only one of the four glass windows remains, wavy and yellowed by time. There's no plumbing, no electricity, but the fireplace still works. And there's a wood pile in the corner that my father and I collected years ago. I start a small fire, counting on the mist to obscure any telltale smoke. While the fire catches, I sweep out the snow that has accumulated under the empty windows. Using a twig broom, my father made me when I was about eight, and I played house there. Then I sit on the tiny concrete hearth, thawing out by the fire and waiting for Gale. It's a surprisingly short time before he appears. A bow slung over his shoulder, a dead wild turkey he must have encountered along the way, hanging from his belt. He stands in the doorway, as if considering whether or not to enter. He holds the unopened leather bag of food, the flask, Sinna's gloves, gifts he will not accept because of his anger at me. I know exactly how he feels. Didn't I do exactly the same thing to my mother? I look in his eyes. His temper can't quite mask the hurt. The sense of betrayal he feels at my engagement to Peta. This will be my last chance, this meeting today, to not lose Gail forever. I could take hours trying to explain and even then have him refuse me. Instead, I go straight to the heart of my defense. President Snow personally threatened to have you killed, I say. Gail raises his eyebrows slightly, but there's no real show of fear or astonishment. Anyone else? Well, he didn't actually give me a copy of the list, but it's a good guess it includes both our families, I say. It's enough to bring him to the fire. He crouches before the hearth and warms himself. Unless what? Unless nothing now, I say. Obviously, this requires more of an explanation, but I have no idea where to start. So I just sit there staring gloomily into the fire. After about a minute of this, Gail breaks the silence. Well, thanks for the heads up. I turn to him, ready to snap, but I catch the glint in his eye. I hate myself for smiling. This is not a funny moment, but I guess it's a lot to drop on someone. We're all going to be obliterated no matter what. I do have a plan, you know. Yeah, I bet it's a stunner, he says. He tosses the gloves on my lap. Here. I don't want your fiancé's old gloves. He's not my fiancé. That's just part of the act. And these aren't his gloves. They were Sinna's, I say. Give them back then, he says. Pulls on the gloves, flexes his fingers, and nods in approval. At least I'll die in comfort. That's optimistic. How? Co of course you don't know what's happened, I say. Let's have it, he says. I decided to begin with the night Peta and I were crowned victors of the Hunger Games, and Hamish warned me of the capital's fury. I tell him about the uneasiness that dogged me even once I was back home. President Snow's visit to my house, the murders in District 11, the tension in the crowds, the last-ditch effort of my engagement, the president's indication that it hadn't been enough, my certainty that I'll have to pay. Gail never interrupts. While I talk, he tucks the gloves in his pocket and occupies himself with turning the food in the leather bag into a meal for us. Toasting bread and cheese, co coring apples, placing chestnuts in the fire to roast, I watch his hands, his beautiful, capable fingers. Scarred, as mine were before the capital erased all marks from my skin, but strong and deft, hands that, I, that have the power to mine coal, but the precision to set a delicate snare. Hands I trust. I pause to take a drink of tea from the flask before I tell him about my homecoming. Well, you really made a mess of things, he said. I'm not even done, I tell him. I've heard enough for a moment. Let's skip ahead of this plan of yours, he says. I take a deep breath. We run away. What? he asks. This has actually caught him off guard. We take to the woods and make a run for it, I say. His face is impossible to read. Will he laugh at me? Dismiss this as foolishness? 
I rise in agitation, preparing for an argument. You said yourself that you thought we could do it. That morning of the reaping, you said... He steps in, and I feel myself lifted off the ground. The room spins, and I have to lock my arms around Gail's neck to brace myself. He's laughing, happy. Hey, I protest, but I'm laughing too. Gail sets me down, but doesn't release his hold on me. Okay, let's run away, he says. Really? You don't think I'm mad? You'll go with me? Some of the crushing weight begins to lift as it transfers to Gail's shoulders. I do think you're mad, and I'll still go with you, he says. He means it. Not only means it, but welcomes it. We can do it. I know we can. Let's get out of here and never come back. You're sure, I say, because it's going to be hard with the kids and all. I don't want to get five miles into the woods and have you... I'm sure. I'm completely, entirely, 100% sure. He tilts his forehead down to rest against mine and pulls me closer. His skin, his whole being, radiates heat from being so near to the fire. And I close my eyes, soaking in his warmth. I breathe in the smell of snow-dampened leather and smoke and apples, the smell of those wintry days we shared before the games. I don't try to move away. Why should I anyway? His voice drops to a whisper. I love you. That's why. I never see these things coming. They happen too fast. One second you're proposing an escape plan, and the next you're expected to deal with something like this. I came up with what must be the worst possible response. I know. It sounds terrible. Like I assume he couldn't help but loving me, but that I don't feel anything in return. Gail starts to draw away, but I grab hold of him. I know! And you! You know what you are to me! It's not enough. He breaks my grip. Gail! I can't think about anyone that way right now. All I can think about every day, every waking minute, since they drew Prim's name at the reaping, is how afraid I am. And there doesn't seem to be room for anything else. If we could get away somewhere somewhere safe, maybe I could be different. I don't know. I can see him swallowing his disappointment. So we'll go. We'll find out. He turns back to the fire, where the chestnuts are beginning to burn. He flips them onto the hearth. My mother's going to take some convincing. I guess he's still going anyway, but the happiness has fled, leaving an all-too-familiar strain in its place. Mine, too. I'll just have to have to make her see reason. Take her for a long walk. Make sure she understands that we won't survive the alternative. She'll understand. I watched a lot of the games with her and Prim. She won't say no to you, says Gail. I hope not. The temperature in the house seems to have dropped 20 degrees in a matter of seconds. Hamish will be the real challenge. Hamish? Gil abandons the chestnuts. You're not asking him to come with us. I have to, Gail. I can't leave him and Peter because they... His scowl cuts me off. What? I'm sorry. I didn't realize how large our party was. He snapped at me. They torture them to death, trying to find out where I was, I say. What about Pia's family? They'll never come. In fact, they probably couldn't wait to inform on us, which I'm sure he's smart enough to realize. What if he decides to stay, he asks. I tried to sound indifferent, but my voice cracks. Then he stays. You'd leave him behind? Gail asks. To save Prim and my mother? Yes, I answer. I mean, no! I'll get him to come. And me? Would you leave me? Gail's expression is rock hard now. Just if, for instance, I can't convince my mother to drag three young kids into the wilderness in winter. Hazel won't refuse. She'll see sense, I say. Suppose she doesn't, Katniss. What then? He demands. Then you have to force her, Gail. Do you think I'm making this stuff up? My voice is rising in anger as well. No, 
I don't know. Maybe the president's just manipulating you. I mean, he's throwing your wedding. You saw how the Capitol reacted. I don't think he could afford to kill you or PETA. How's he going to get out of that one, says Gail. Well, with an uprising in District 8. I doubt he's spending much time choosing my wedding cake, I shout. The instant my words are out of my mouth, I want to reclaim them. Their effect on Gale is immediate. The flush of his cheeks, the brightness of his gray eyes. There's an uprising in eight, he says in a hushed voice. I try to backpedal, to defuse him, as I try to defuse the districts. I don't know if it's really an uprising. There's unrest. People in the streets, I say. Gale grabs my shoulders. What did you see? Nothing in per in person. I just heard something. As usual, it's too little, too late. I give up and I tell him. I saw something on the mayor's television. I wasn't supposed to. There was a crowd and fires and the peacekeepers were gunning people down, but they were fighting back. I bit my lip and struggled to continue describing the scene. Instead, I say aloud the words that have been eating me up inside. And it's my fault, Gail. I say. It's my fault because of what I did in the arena. If I had just killed myself with those berries, none of this would have happened. Peter could have come home and lived, and everyone else would have been safe too. <sighs> safe to do what? He says in a gentler tone. Starve? Work like slaves? Send their kids to the reaping? You haven't hurt people. You've given them an opportunity. They just have to be brave enough to take it. There's already been talk in the mines. People who want to fight. Don't you see? It's happening. It's finally happening. If there's an uprising in District 8, why not here? Why not everywhere? This could be it. The thing we've been... Stop it! You don't know what you're saying! The peacekeepers outside of 12, they're not like Darius or even Cray. The lives of district people, they mean nothing to them, I say. That's why we have to join the fight he answers harshly. No! We have to leave here before they kill us, and a lot of other people too. I'm yelling again, but I can't understand why he's doing this. Why doesn't he see why it's so undeni what's so undeniable? Gail pushes me roughly away from him. You leave then. I'd never go in a million years. You were happy enough to go before... I don't see how an uprising in District 8 does anything but make it more important that we leave. You're just mad about... No, I can't throw Peta in his face. What about your family? What about the other families, Katniss? The ones who can't run away. Don't you see? It can't be about just saving us anymore. Not if the rebellion's begun. Gail shakes his head, not hiding his disgust with me. You could do so much. He throws Sinna's gloves at my feet. I change my mind. I don't want anything they made in the capital. And he's gone. I look down in the gloves. At the gloves. Anything they made in the capital? Was that directed at me? Does he think I am now just another product of the capital and therefore somehow untouchable? The unfairness of it all fills me with rage, but it's mixed up with fear over what kind of crazy thing he might do next. I sink down next to the fire, desperate for comfort, to work out my next move. I calm myself by thinking that rebellions don't happen in a day. Gail can't talk to the miners until tomorrow. If I can get to Hazel before then, she might straighten him out. But I can't go now. If he's there, he'll lock me out. Maybe tonight, after everyone's asleep. Hazel often works late into the night finishing laundry. I could go then, tap at the window, tell her the situation so she'll keep Gail from doing anything foolish. My, my conversation with President Snow in the study comes back to me. My advisors are concerned that you would be difficult. But you're not planning on being difficult, are you? No. That's what I told them. I said any girl who goes to such lengths to preserve her life isn't going to be interested in throwing it away with both hands. I think of how hard Hazel has worked to keep that family alive. Surely she'll be on my side in this matter. Or won't she? It must be getting on toward noon now, and the days are so short. 
No point in being in the woods after dark if you don't have to. I stamp out the remains of my little fire, clear up the scraps of food, and tuck Senna's gloves in my belt. I guess I'll hang on to them for a while, in case Gale has a change of heart. I think of the look on his face when he flung them to the ground, how repelled he was by them, by me. I trudge through the woods and reach my old house while there's still light. My conversation with Gale was an obvious setback, but I'm still determined to carry out my plan to escape District 12. I decide to find Peter next, in a strange way. Since he's seen some of what I've seen on the tour, he may be an easier sell than Gale was. I run into him as he's leaving the victor's village. Been hunting, he asks. You can see he doesn't think it's a good idea. Not really. Going to town, I ask. Yeah, I'm supposed to eat dinner with my family, he says. Well, at least I can I at least walk you in? The road from the victor's village to the square gets little use. It's a safe enough place to talk, but I can't seem to get the words out. Proposing it to Gail was such a disaster, I gnaw on my chapped lips. The square gets closer with every step. I may not have an opportunity again soon. I take a deep breath, and I let the words rush out. Peta, if I asked you to run away from the district with me, would you? Peta takes my arm, bringing me to a stop. He doesn't need to check my face to see if I'm serious. It depends on why you're asking. President Snow wasn't convinced by me. There's an uprising District 8. We have to get out, I say. By we, do you mean just you and me? No. Who else would be going, he asks. My family. Yours, if they want to come. Hamish, maybe, I say. What about Gail, he says. I don't know. He might have other plans, I say. Peter shakes his head and gives me a rueful smile. I bet he does. Sure, Katniss, I'll go. I feel a slight twinge of hope. You will? Yeah, but I don't think for a minute you will, he says. I jerk my arm away. Then you don't know me. Be ready. It could be any time. I take off walking, and he follows a pace or two behind. Katniss, Peter says. I don't slow down. If he thinks it's a bad idea, I don't want to know, because it's the only one I have. Katniss, hold up. I kick a dirty, frozen chunk of snow off the path and let him catch up. The coal dust makes everything look especially ugly. I really will go if you want me to. I just think we better talk it through with Hamish. Make sure we won't be making things worse for everyone. He raises his head. What's that? I lift my chin. I've been so consumed with my own worries, I haven't noticed the strange noise coming from the square. A whistling. The sound of an impact. The intake of breath from the crowd. Come on, Peter says, his face suddenly hard. I don't know why. I can't place the sound or even guess at the situation. But it means something bad to him. When we reach the square, it's clear something's happening. But the crowd's too thick to see. Peter steps up on a crate against the wall of the sweet shop and offers me a hand while he scans the square. I'm halfway up when he suddenly blocks my way. Get down. Get out of here. He's whispering, but his voice is harsh with insistence. What? I say, trying to force my way back up. Go home, Katniss. I'll be there in a minute, I swear, he says. Whatever it is, it's terrible. I yank away from his hand and begin to push my way through the crowd. People see me recognize my face and then look panicked hands shove me back back voices hiss get out of here girl only gonna make it worse what do you want to do getting killed but at this point my heart is beating so fast and fierce that I hardly hear them out I only know that whatever waits in the middle of that square is meant for me when I finally break through the cleared space I see I'm right and Peter was right and those voices were right too Gail's wrists are bound to a wooden post the wild turkey he shot earlier hangs above him, the nail driven through its neck. His jacket's been cast aside on the ground, his shirt torn away. He slumps unconscious on his knees, held up only by the ropes at his wrist. 
What used to be his back is a raw, bloody slab of meat. Standing beside him is a man I've never seen, but I recognize his uniform. It's the one designated for our head peacekeeper. This isn't old Cray, though. This is a tall, muscular man with sharp creases in his pants. The pieces of the picture don't quite come together until I see his arm raise the whip.